And Nancy, uh, uh, she stepped out. Um, only thing I can think of is uh, when Brother Paul was talking about the four or five hours that we spent is I actually had told somebody I think it would only take an hour and a half, you know, for us to fill those bags. And I was so wrong. And uh, um, but um, hey, this past week I walked into a pod and a guy was sitting there reading his um, reading his track that we put in there, you know, and that just encouraged my heart. Uh, if you got your Bibles, I pray that you do, in Mark chapter 8, Mark chapter 8, and verse 1 is where we're, um, uh, verse 22, sorry, as we continue on um, through the book of Mark, and um, Mark chapter 8 and verse 22. And if you would, I'm going to ask you to stand in honor of God's Word as we read this, and uh, as we look at this this morning, as we stand, we're just believing in God's uh, word has authority over our life, and we're recognizing that. And it says, And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up, and he said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. And then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. Father, my prayer is this. May the word of God be spoken boldly in this place today. And may you accompany it with your signs and wonders. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may have a seat. Yes, uh, there you are, Nancy. Uh, okay, no, that's all right. You, you got to watch. I mean, I, th I really thought maybe I just overlooked you, you know. Uh, you know, did I hear you chuckle when he said, you know, uh, that the bags took us four to five hours? I mean, and, uh, you know, because I was like, yeah, hour and a half. Hey, I want to say this while this is on my heart. You know, um, you know, two more Sundays we'll be signing up, folks, for this uh, marriage retreat. But if the $100, if, if money is an issue to you, Let's not let it not be an issue, you know, and um, um, I've already had someone share with me that they would scholarship someone, and uh, so um, I, just, I just want you to be encouraged by that weekend. I hope that you're able to go. You know, Dollar General can be an interesting spot. Y'all agree with that, you know? I mean, you really never know what you're going to get when you walk into a Dollar General, you know, and I mean, some of them are really neat and, uh, and tiny. Uh, but I've been in those Dollar Generals where it's, you know, you're, you know, uh, you probably could get lost and someone never find you in the midst of the boxes and stuff like that that are in the, in the rows. Well, I was in Dollar General yesterday. I was not going to begin my sermon like this, but, but then something happened to me that just made it clear that I needed to share this story with you. But I was in Dollar General because I had one of those $5 coupons that said, if I got $25 worth of stuff, I would get $5 off. And so I had some stuff I wanted to get. And I was looking for some deodorant because I'm a deodorant kind of guy. And, um, and, and over to the right of me, I heard this, this, this man and this lady, they were talking. I was not listening in at all to their conversation because I'm zoned in, wanted to make sure that I've got the right uh, deodorant uh, that I'm going after because I've got my $5 coupon, which is pretty important. And, and all of a sudden, I hear this guy say, I bet this guy, me, knows what I'm talking about. And I'm actually, I look at him, I go, oh, me? I, I said, actually, I don't. I have no idea what you're talking about. I really wasn't listening. And he says, you know, when you're doing mushrooms, the drugs, okay? <laughs> and, and you have this moment of great clarity about your life. You know, he says, like, there's a moment when you just remember all the crappy, he didn't say crappy, um, things you've done and all the good that you've done. It's just a moment of clarity. And I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. I've never done mushrooms, and it's not in my plans. But, but, but you know, great clarity and sight 
is something we all really do want. It is something that we want. I mean, just a few years ago, um, this is actually how I was going to begin my sermon. Um, I, I used to not ever have to wear glasses at all. And I had great eyesight. And, and suddenly I began to realize that my eyes were changing. I would go into a restaurant. I would totally embarrass my kids because the very first thing that I would do when I went into the restaurant is I would pull out my phone and turn on my light so I could see the menu, you know, and maybe you can resonate with me on that because I couldn't see it. It was, it was, it's, uh, it was just unreadable to me. And then eventually I got some reader glasses, and I was very dependent upon them. I'll never forget one Sunday um, at Calvary where I was pastoring um, that I had to have someone read the Scripture passage because when I got up and I looked at the Bible, I absolutely could not uh, read it. And so what I would do is I would strategically lead, leave reading glasses all over the place, you know, including the pulpit. Matter of fact, we have... Uh, this, these are my readers right here, you know, and um, that I had put up here before uh, a couple of, you know, about a year and a half ago, I went to the eye doctor and he put me into some bifocals. And, um, and so, you know, I mean, I see things a lot better now, thankfully, you know, I, I know what it's like to, to be thankful for clarity, not from mushrooms, you know, uh, but just to be able to see, you know, and so the goal is to see clearly. Now, if you've been writing with us faithfully in the book of Mark, and several of you have been here almost every Sunday, you know that these disciples have not been seeing very clearly at all. You know, matter of fact, uh, sometimes they look quite foolish like they did last week whenever we told the story you know, Jesus had just, you know, fed the 4,000, and they get into a boat, and, um, and Jesus makes a statement to them, hey, look, y'all need to be careful of uh, the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod and uh, King Herod. And, and the next thing you know, they're sitting there worried and fretting over the fact that they only had one loaf of bread in the boat with them. What if they were to get hungry? They didn't realize, you know, that the one who just created bread and fish out of loaves and fishes is in the boat with them. And sometimes we forget that ourselves. You know, Jesus even asked them he's some very important questions. You know, and it seems like he was frustrated with them. He says, having eyes, do you not see? Do, do you not see? Guys, uh, having ears, do you not hear? Do you not comprehend or understand? And so I think it's very interesting that the very next miracle that we have in the book of Mark is the one that we just read about, which is the healing of the blind man. Guys, this miracle is only found in Mark. You cannot find it in any other gospel. There are two miracles in Mark that are only in Mark, and this is one of them. And I believe that Mark is very intentional including this. Now, you remember that Mark is has been Peter's right-hand man, okay? All right? That's how Mark knows these stories because he's heard Peter tell him and tell others and repeat the stories about his time with Jesus Christ. And I just could hear Peter saying to Mark one day, you know, one day, man, this is kind of funny and you're going to come to think this is kind of silly, but Jesus fed 4,000 people with bread and fish, and, and man, it was amazing. We had, we had baskets left over, you know, it was so good, and, and, and we get in a boat, and all we could do is sit there and fret over the fact that we had one loaf. And do you know what Jesus said to us? Jesus looked around at us and he says, man, do, guys, do you not have eyes? Can't you see? Don't you have ears to hear? Can't you, been, haven't you been hearing what I've been able to say? I mean, do you not yet comprehend? I, I can just see Peter telling Mark, Mark, we just, you know, when that set in, what Jesus said, man, it just absolutely uh, man, it was humiliating. It, it, it just was depressing, you know, that, that I've seen Jesus do all these things, and yet here we are, the ones who have been, been, been there for so many miracles, and, and yet we just blew it. Can I ask you something? You ever feel that way? 
You ever feel like, oops, I did it again, Lord? God, I, 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 I should be having more joy in my life, God, but yet these circumstances of my life just seems to be piling in on me. I, God, I, I, should, I should be dealing with temptation better than I am. I've been a believer for so long. Lord, I should have all this in place. And so Jesus does an extraordinary thing. Let me say this before we dig into this. Garrett, if you, uh, maybe I don't have it on. There we go. I now have it on. You know, just to show you how important this passage and what immediately follows, because this is, this story is so, so important and what comes after. You know, many commentators have called this section right in here in Mark, the continental divide of the gospel of Mark. You know, uh, the United States has a continental divide. It's a range of mountains. And you know, on one side, all the rivers flow this way toward the Pacific Ocean. On the other side of the continental divide, all the rivers flow the other way to the Gulf of Mexico and to the Atlantic Ocean. You know, it, it kind of splits uh, the United States. You see, this is the continental divide of the gospel of Mark because everything leading up to this you know, has had purpose. It's really been Jesus' public ministry, okay? But, but everything following this, you know, is, is, is really different. It's, it's really the peak. This passage right here is the peak, and the passage following right next to it, and verses 27 through 30, where Peter will say, you are the Christ. When Jesus said, who do, who do you say I am? Well, you're the Christ, it was the pinnacle confession because up to that moment, not a single human being had ever said that. You are the Christ. The demons had said it. You know, you are the Holy One of God. But that confession has not come out of the lips of any human being. And yet we're about to hear it in verses 27 through 30. In two weeks, we're going to talk about that. But Jesus, that is really the pinnacle. It's the continental divide of the book of Mark. Because from that point on, up to, up to this point, it's really been a very public ministry that Jesus has had all in and around Galilee and also up into some of the Gentile parts. But guys, from this moment on, Jesus is going to have a private ministry with his disciples, preparing them for his death and resurrection. So it's very significant what we have here, okay? You know, because, because I believe that this miracle has everything to do with what has happened and what is to come. It has everything to do with that. Let me, let me put it like this. The very first thing that we want to see is a visual parable, okay? A visual parable. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, and he led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. Okay? All right, a visual parable. See, Jesus and his disciples arrive in Bethsaida on the northeastern shore of the Sea of Galilee, and immediately they met by this group who is bringing him a blind man, and they begged Jesus to touch him, okay? No doubt they've heard of Jesus' compassion. They've heard what Jesus is capable and willing to do. And, and so Jesus, I mean, he, he's just being Jesus. He, he, he's very tender in how he treats this man, okay, all right? He, first thing he does is that Jesus touches, he takes this man by his hand. And he leads him out of the village into an area of privacy. Because, because one of the things that Jesus is not going to do here, this man is not going to be a spectacle. This man is not going to be a sideshow. Okay, all right? So Jesus takes him aside out of the village. He takes him to 
a private place. And then he does something unusual. Jesus spits on his eyes and he asks him, do you see anything? And, and now listen, the very fact that Jesus asked him that question tells me that Jesus did not expect him to have perfect sight, okay? Jesus is doing something. Jesus is teaching something. Jesus is bringing a very visual, you know, parable to his disciples and to those that, that are with him. So, so when this man says, hey, the, I see men, but they're like trees, Jesus is not surprised at all. You know, this man is saying, I still don't see clearly, but I see. Now, there's been a great debate over why Jesus does this and why he touches this man the second time. I mean, why couldn't he do it the first time? Did something go wrong? You know, did he need more dirt and spit? I don't know. You know, I mean, there's been all kinds of debate. Why did Jesus touch this guy a second time? But then in verse 25, it tells us that Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again he opened his eyes, his eyesight was restored, and the scripture says he saw everything clearly. Now here's, here's what I believe. I believe that what happened in this scripture was not an accident at all. I don't think Jesus goofed. I don't think that his batteries were on low and his healing capability was not 100%. I don't think that's it at all. But because we have other examples of the Lord healing blind people, and it's quite clear that all Jesus had to do was, hey, your sight is restored. He could have done it, you know, by just his words. He had all the power. Nothing was impossible to him. You know, he, all he had to do was say a word. Why did he do it in two steps. Why did he do it? And this guy was healed up to a certain point. He could see, but not clearly, and then touch him again. I believe that Jesus was very deliberate. I believe that he had purpose. You see, nothing that Jesus did was ever by accident. Jesus was always very deliberate, you know, and, and when he varied his technique, you know, he, I think he had good reason to do so. If Jesus healed everybody the same way, then people would try to reenact the act itself. So Jesus didn't always heal people the same way, but I believe that he had great purpose. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, um, and man, just one of the most powerful sermons that he ever preached, he put it this way. He says, it was due to our Lord's own determined plan to the work is in to do the work in this given way in order that he might teach a lesson and give a certain message. In other words, all of our Lord's miracles are more than events. They are, in a sense, parables as well. See, the miracle is a visual parable itself. That does not mean that we do not believe in the actual incident as a fact in history. I'm simply asserting that a miracle is also a parable. And if that is true of all the miracles, it's especially true of this one. For our Lord obviously varied the procedure here in order to bring out and teach an important and vital lesson. And that's most certainly what we have here. Jesus, by the healing of the man in this particular way, is giving a visual parable in front of his disciples. See, he doesn't usually perform miracles in this fashion by half healing someone, then fully healing. But the only thing that, that, that we could just really conjecture it is this. Jesus is doing this for a deliberate reason. I believe that he's saying his, to his disciples, you are just like this man. You, your eyes have been opened to a certain extent, but yet you have not yet seen everything clearly. And that's evident. You just worried about a loaf of bread and, and you know, when you just saw me make bread and fish and feed 4,000 people. It's evident that you are struggling to understand who I am. You've been partially healed, but yet you don't see clearly. You see men, but they're like trees. Sinclair Ferguson said this, what is the significance of this? Was it that this man was particularly a difficult case for Jesus? Hardly. Was this miracle then like others a sign? Yes. But to whom? To the man? No. To the disciples. 
And this is confirmed by the fact that Jesus had already asked them about their vision of him in verse 18. He was now leading them by hand to the point at which their sight would become clearer. And Peter would confess, you are the Christ in verse 29. Their spiritual understanding did not come instantaneously, but gradually. They too needed the second touch from the hands of the master. So, so hear me out. You know, you know I, I, I've often thought about how it must have felt to those disciples for Jesus to have gotten on to them, for Jesus to say to them, men, don't you get it? But I'm going to be honest with you. I think the Lord just wants to rip heaven up every now and then and look down at Johnny and go, Johnny, don't you get this? Johnny, don't you understand who I am? Johnny, don't you grasp who I, who I, I am and what I can be to you? You know, he, he looks at his disciples and he says, do you have eyes to see? Do you have ears to hear? Don't you get it? it guys, it had to be frustrating to them. But what a loving thing for Jesus to do, to come alongside of them, to give them this visual picture that says, you know what? You, we don't always get it instantaneously. We don't always get it in a moment to teach them the fact that seeing clearly isn't always a quick process, that even though Jesus chose these 12 men personally himself, they don't instantly become theologians. They don't instantly become masters of their spiritual life. And I just think there's a lesson for you and me, that maybe seeing clearly isn't always as easy as we think. All right? I'm going to do these things and boy, I'm going to get it. You know what? I'm going to be the most mature Christian believer that there is. And people are just going to see me shine, shine, shine. You know, and, and maybe seeing things or people or issues today isn't easier for us than even those of the first followers of Jesus. Maybe sometimes we can struggle too. It's easy to get discouraged in your, in your walk, you know, like, I just can't believe that, that I did that again. I, I can't believe that, that, I, that I should have joy and I'm sitting here and I've got such anxiety and I've got such, you know, I'm worried about all these things and they're just heavy laden and you're walking around and it looks like somebody has shot, you know, your, your, your pet animal, you know. I mean, you're just gloomy all the time and it just shows I wish I could just see clearly right now. And you're miserable because you don't have that spiritual clarity in your life. And you're discouraged and you feel downtrodden. And, and, and often you feel that, man, maybe there's just something wrong with me. Because it seems like everybody else gets it and I don't. But I want you to see this picture that Jesus puts before you and me in the healing of this man. You know, Jesus didn't even have to touch this man. See, the truth of the matter is that Jesus isn't done with you and me. He's not done with us. And I want you to remember, we, we talked about this extensively um, a, over a year ago. Jesus is gentle and lowly. He, he told us, you know, and all the words that he could have used to describe himself in Matthew 11, 28 and 30, he tells us, come to me, all who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Of all the things that Jesus could have used to describe himself, this is what he uses. You see, here's the matter of the fact, the fact of the matter, okay, all right? Jesus knows we're mess ups. Jesus knows we struggle. Jesus knows we don't always give the right answers. We don't always get it right. Sometimes we, we just struggle. You know, Dane Ortland, uh, who wrote that book that we read called Gentle and Lowly, he says in the one place in the Bible, Matthew 11, 28, 30, where the Son of God pulls back the veil, lets us peer way down into the very core of who he is, we're not told that he is austere, demanding in heart. We're not told that he's exalted and dignified in heart. We're not even told that he's joyful and generous in heart. Letting Jesus set the terms, his surprising claim, he's gentle and lowly in heart. In other words, he gets us. And he loves us anyway. 
and he's accessible to us. Dane Orland would go on to say, you know, guys, we cannot present a reason for Christ to finally close off his heart to his own sheep. If, he, if that was true, he would have kicked the disciples out of the boat several times. But he doesn't. And he does it with you and me. No such reason exists. Every human friend has a limit. If we offend enough, if a relationship gets damaged enough, if we betray enough times, we're cast out. The walls go up. But listen to this. With Christ, our sins and weaknesses are the very resume items that qualify us to approach him. You see, he's gentle, guys. The fact that we, we screw up, the fact that we don't always get it, it makes, that's, that's, that's why he is who he is. And that's why we have this, this, because I think he's visually showing his disciples here. You know what, guys, you don't always see clearly right off the bat. You don't always get it. Jesus do, does not love us like, like we love other people. We love until we're betrayed. Jesus continued to the cross despite betrayal. We love until we're forsaken. Jesus loved through forsakenness. We up love up to a limit. Jesus loves to the end. And so we have this visual parable right in front of his disciples. But there's the second thing that I want to show you here. Is we see a vital participation, okay? So Jesus, he took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the village. When he had spit on his eyes... He laid on his hands on him. I know some of y'all just want me to dig into that, the fact that Jesus spit on his eyes, all right? I, I just want y'all to know Jesus can spit on me anytime he wants to, okay, all right? I, and, uh, uh, but, but, but he, and he laid his hands on him, and he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, now notice that. Jesus asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and he said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. And then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. This is what I mean by vital participation, okay? Jesus asked this man if he could see anything. What if this man just settled with partial sight? What if this man would have just said, Woo! Man, this is so much better than I had it, you know? I mean, thank you, Jesus. What if this man was not honest with Jesus? You know, just settled with a little sight. But no, he doesn't do this. What does he do? He, it's very vital that he participates. He's honest with Jesus as he assesses his sight. Jesus, I see people, but they look like trees walking. And what saved this man? You know what saved this man? He was absolutely honest. Amen. You know, it's like when you go to the doctor and and, and I, you know, I had to go to the doctor here not too long ago, and she's trying to figure out my whole sinus thing. And she's, pro, you know, she's pushing in certain parts of my head, like, does this hurt? Does this hurt? You know? And, and but the thing about it, if you went to the doctor, and, you know, and, and, and you just, you were not honest with them, you know? Does this hurt? No, no, that not hurt at all, you know? And, uh, you know, does this hurt? No, not at all, you know? And, 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 but the, the, the very best thing when you go to the doctor is what? Honesty. You want to figure out what's going on. You know, and, and so the only way to ever find the problem is, is to be honest. Guys, listen, hear me out on this. You and I, we can't continue on saying that we're all right if we're not all right. We, we can continue on saying, yep, I got this spirituality down, man, I got it going on, you know, and, and uh, I'm super, super Christian, you know, and, 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 and when we're not, you know, I mean, some of you don't even have spiritual life at all. I mean, you're, you're dead still in your sins and 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 maybe you're trying to do the religion thing and you're trying to do the church thing and 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 but you don't have a personal savior you don't really know jesus listen the only way that you're ever going to get better is what are you saying i see men but they look like uh, trees okay the only way that we're ever going to get better is if we're brutally honest with god god i'm struggling 
God, I'm, I'm struggling with this anxiety. God, I'm struggling with this temptation. I don't have this. God, I'm struggling with being the husband that you want me to be to my wife. Lord, I'm struggling. I've not arrived. I don't have my stuff together. Listen, you don't want to spend, you don't want to step into eternity unsure of the fact whether or not you have Jesus because you never were honest, brutally honest, that there was something missing in your life and you knew it, but you didn't want to talk about it. You didn't want to expose it. You didn't want to be honest about it. This man, Jesus says, do you see anything? I see, but man, man, they look like, men look like trees. Eh, it ain't quite there. You know, so Jesus touches him again. And what do we see? We see a victorious physician. That's what he is. You see, then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Amen. Jesus didn't leave him with partial sight. Jesus was not content to leave this man imperfect and un, with uncertain sight. You know, when just looking out, seeing men, they look like trees walking around. No. Jesus touched his eyes again, and his eyes were restored, and he saw clearly. Hey, somebody needs to hear this this morning. Jesus isn't going to step away from you, okay? Just because you're not perfect just because you don't have it all together he isn't going to leave you alone to figure it out on your own now what does jesus do he finished the work that he began in the life of this man he didn't give up on this man but he did not give up on his disciples either just because they didn't have complete clarity just because they were idiots at times and said the wrong things he didn't throw him out of the boat. And I'm so thankful for that Old Testament passage where it talks about the fact that, that the potter saw the clay marred in his hands and he did not throw the clay away. He just kept working with it. Because Jesus is going to keep working with his disciples. Because in the very next passage, you know what Peter does? You are the Christ. Amen. It's like that was the moment that the book of Mark has been waiting on. The one thing that this man did and the one thing that we need to do was we need to be brutally honest with ourselves. But we need to also submit to Jesus and whatever he wants to do. He didn't object. Well, you didn't get it right the first time, Jesus. We're not going to give you another shot, you know. No, he let Jesus do his thing. And I just think that we too need to have a submissive heart. That I may not be everything God wants me to be right now, but I'm going to submit to him. And I'm going to submit to the things that he's laid out for me in 2023 that can grow me and give me greater, greater clarity and, and insight. And, and, and so I'll be able to see Jesus, you know. And, and so, guys, we too need to have this submissive heart. After you get that reality gut check, come to him in utter submission. Lord, I don't see clearly now. All, it looks like a bunch of trees out there. But, Lord, I'm submitting to you. The book of Proverbs says, but the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn which shines brighter and brighter until full day and guys this walk that we're walking on it may be the light of dawn right now but guys you keep walking that walk you keep struggling that struggle and one day the full day brightness is coming you just keep you know too often we get discouraged with ourselves and we get discouraged and disappointed with other people and we want to quit and we want to drop out i'm here to tell you don't give up Amen. the victorious physician he's in your corner and he is here 
And see, nobody is instantly transformed. As one preacher put it, the Christian life is a narrow path and there are ditches on each side. One is the ditch of presumption and the other is the ditch of despair. You know, and, and too often we enter the kingdom of God, we think, now I'm going to be happy, now things are going to, to go my way, and then we run into temptations and disappointments and struggles and discouragement and people let you down and, and you feel your own heart, it's, that it ain't perfect. And, and, and you know what, it's, it's so dangerous to say, you know what, I've tried Jesus, he couldn't help me, you know, I, I just, I don't, it's not what I thought that it would would be and then we stop doing stuff we stop coming to church and we stop doing our devotions and we stop reading the word of God and we stop praying and we back off to the fringes of the church and we just continue where we were when I was a little kid in an old Baptist church we used to sing this song are you weary and heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you sighing over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus. Have you ever read the Psalms? The Psalms, they're brutally honest. You know, the, the, they, they tell God, Lord, my feet feel like they're giving away. God, they're falling down. They ask God, God, why are you hiding your face from me? They ask him why they feel so terribly alone. Hurry up and listen, God. Come and rescue me. That's how the psalmist responded to God. They were very open and honest, but they would submit themselves to the Lord. And almost in the same psalm, David at times would be, God, where are you? I will trust in the Lord by the end of the chapter, you know? I mean, guys... I think it's sometimes the devil that comes along and he whispers to us, you know, it's too late for all that stuff now, man. Listen, it's never too late. Why should we, why should we tell them, Lord, I see, but they're like men. They're like trees walking around. You know, we're not meant to be left in a state of doubt and misgiving or uncertainty. Let me tell you this. Jesus didn't come to earth and die and resurrect so that you and I could just walk around just miserable all the time. Guys, he came so that one day we would see clearly that we would see like never before. And one day he's going to glorify us and we will see like never before. You know, but I, can I tell you this? One thing I know about me, because cause I look back at 53 years of living my life, and I wish the Johnny now could have tackled some of the issues of the, that Johnny back then, because I'm not that same guy. Man, he's, he's done a, a great work in my life. A work of grace and mercy. and But man, it's taken me a lot of time to get to where I'm at. And I'm not done yet. You know, I'm like, I'm not that man. Let me give you one more verse and we're done. I, I thought that last verse is interesting. Okay? He sent him, home, he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. I'm like, whoa, Jesus, you know, what's up with that? You know, though Jesus healed while he was on this earth and he comforted and he great hope through those healings, Jesus' ultimate purpose was not to come to heal. It was to come to save. You know, and so Jesus didn't want at this point in his ministry you know, another healing session in Bethsaida. He had a greater mission in mind because Peter is going to claim that he is the Christ. And in the very next passage, Jesus begins to tell them about the death and resurrection. And I just want to tell you this. 
Jesus has not come to be your personal genie. He's come to be your personal Savior. Okay? He's not come to, to, to just give you everything that you want or even those things that you think that you might need. He's come to save you. Amen. See, some people, that's what they want. They want God to be a genie. He's not a genie. He's come to save you. But he's also calling you to, to lordship. He wants you he wants you to give your life to Him, for Him to be your Savior and Lord forever. That's why He came. That's why He came. So that one day we'll be able to see perfectly, completely perfectly. So here's our so what for the day. So what do we, have, what do we need to do about this? Guys, one, one, do you resonate with the disciples and are frustrated with the fact that you're disappointed with yourself? Y'all ever get frustrated with yourself? I do. You know, like tw three times last week, you know? Uh, you know, guys, focus on the fact that Jesus is gentle and lowly and he hasn't given up on you. And you don't need to give up on you. And then second of all, if Jesus were to ask you, what do you see? What well, would you be honest with him? Lord, God, I see, but man, I, there's some stuff we got to work on, Lord, me and you. Honesty is the starting place. Where are you? How, how's your sight today? And then three, will you submit yourself anew to Jesus, knowing that he is the victorious physician who can help? Will you allow him to work or will you turn from the one who gave, who can give you clear sight? Sometimes you're like, I'm just not going to, I'm so frustrated with me and others. I'm just going to stop doing this. And then last of all, is Jesus your genie or is he your savior? Come to him today. Will you pray with me? Guys, I just want to just, I want to beg you again. Like we do every Sunday. Man, if you've never given your life to this wonderful Savior who is the Christ, who is the Messiah, the one who came to save you and set you free, um, will you please give your life to Him today? I beg you, where you're at, in your chair right now, that you would cry out to Him Lord, save me, a sinner. God, I know that I'm a mess up. I know that I'm a, I'm a screw up. But God, I'm asking you to please save my soul and come and change me. Save me, O oh Lord. Will you please give him your life? Will you please give him your life today? You know, please give him your life today. Father, I, I come and I ask you, Lord, that, that if there's someone within the sound of my voice, whether here or on Facebook Live or wherever, oh God, that is struggling with the fact yes. of whether or not they are your child, that God, I pray you would reveal that to them. I pray, Lord, that they would give their life to you, Father God, that you would awaken their heart and mind and life, that they... Give them the faith to trust, to believe, Father Lord, so that, God, they could have this great salvation. But, Lord, help us as believers to believe that, God, that you don't always, you don't give it to us all at once. That, God, there's sanctification. God, there's growth. There's maturity. And, God, you come back to us and touch us again and again and and, and, and conform us into the image of Jesus. But yet one day you're going to glorify us. And we're going to see it all clearly then. Father, thank you for what you're doing in our life. Thank you for Jesus. Lord, I pray that this message was encouragement to someone to not give up. Lord, please, instill this truth into our hearts. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.